Good evening, everyone. We're just going to give it a few minutes to let all of our uh, participants arrive, and then we will get started. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the next program in our Laurier Ed Talk series. My name is Mariah Balbacero, and I am the School Relationship and Outreach Coordinator for the Waterloo Public Library. We are very pleased to welcome you tonight to our discussion on compassionate education. And before we begin, I'm going to pass it over to Manreet, who's going to do our opening introductions. Welcome, everyone. My name is Manreet Verdi. Uh, I'm a communications and events coordinator at Wolf and Laurier University. I'm very excited to be here with you all tonight to continue the Ed Talk series this year. So I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that Wolf and Laurier University's campuses are situated on the Haldeman Tract on the traditional territory of the Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Today, this land is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Acknowledging them reminds us of our important connection to the land. We recognize, honor, and respect these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and water in which Laurier is now present. Wilfrid well, Laurier University and Laurier's Faculty of Education are very pleased to partner with the Waterloo Public Library to present this series of relevant and timely talks. This event is being recorded and will be available on Laurier's YouTube Ed Talk playlist following the event. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the discussion. So please submit your questions at any time throughout the, the Q&A function in Zoom. Our next talk is on more serious about empowering children and youth to be a good citizen in 2022 with Dr. Jennifer Straub, who will explore a variety of ways that teachers, parents, and community members can empower children and youth to take an active role in their community. Following our theme of reimagining education, tonight's lecture, Compassionate Education, will feature Raghav Abid, who has served in who has served as an instructor with Laurier's Faculty of Education at, and as an Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Education Coordinator, and currently a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Education at Western University. With the rise in natural disasters, disease, and conflict worldwide impacting over 65 million people, the number of children who have experienced trauma and violence is on the rise. Thus, a compassion-based framework in education which supports student well-being and equity becomes even more pressing. Research suggests that taking this increasingly holistic approach to education improves students' academic success and well-being and reduces educator stress and burnout. In this talk, the elements of a compassion-based framework, framework in education will be discussed and applied specifically to support refugee students in Ontario. So please welcome me and please join me in welcoming Ragad Abid. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being uh, here with us today. I'd like to thank the uh, Waterloo Public Library as well as Laurier University for organizing and hosting uh, this Laurier Ed Talk series. And I'd also like to thank some of my uh, Laurier colleagues who are here, Dr. Cantalee Williams, uh, Dr. Sider, and Dr. Isa um, Danriat, as well as some of my colleagues from Western. So thank you all for being here with us today. And let's get started. So I will share my screen and hope that you can see my screen there. Good to go. Okay, wonderful. You can see it. All right. So um, I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about what got me interested in the idea of compassionate education. This interest in compassion-based frameworks began about uh, six years ago. Um, I was living in California at the time and I completed a, a compassion cultivation training at Stanford University in their Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. And as an Ontario certified teacher by profession and a PhD candidate in education, um, I started to think about how I can bring that lens into my both practice of teaching and into my research, into my doctoral program. 
So today, while I'll speak about a compassion-based framework um, focusing on uh, newcomers and refugee students, because that's what uh, began my research in 2017, um, I'm also well aware that compassionate education in this approach can benefit all of our students, especially amidst um, continuing to navigate uh, you know, a worldwide pandemic. As some of you may know, many of you may be educators, uh, there is a widespread um, concern about mental health for, for children, for our students, as they continue to navigate school during a pandemic. Um, for many kids, the security of a daily routine was critical to their well-being, and be, being pulled back and forth from their friends, teachers, and schools um, has interrupted that stability, right? And it may have exasper exacerbated existing trauma by losing that face-to-face -face contact with teachers or um, educators, and for others, it may have created an entirely new trauma um, through perhaps uh, losses in the family or job loss leading, leading to food insecurity. So basically, I think we've all recognized that there's this worldwide traumatic event that we're all navigating and that um, a compassion-based framework can really work to uh, support all of our students. So in terms of, um, again, this case for compassionate education, researchers have said there's this necessity, right, to approach um, uh, education from a compassionate perspective as a result of this highest level of suffering that we've encountered since World War II. Um, and, and this kind of really took me, took me by surprise when I first saw it that, you know, um, over 65 million people are impacted by natural disasters, disease, and conflict. And so um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm defining compassion as the ability to recognize and care about the suffering of others and to take some form of appropriate action in response. So it goes beyond the empathy piece. It really goes to recognize the struggle and to take some form of action to alleviate that struggle. Um, and again, researchers will locate uh, uh, the, the approach of compassion education in the field of moral education, civic education, and um, you know, character education, positive psychology, well-being, uh, mind and mindfulness. And I'm also approaching um, compassionate education with, uh, with an emphasis that it works on um, equity and system level shifts. So again, um, it's, it recognizes that there's the impact of trauma and adverse childhood experiences on children's well, uh, well-being um, impacts equity. So equity in terms of, uh, you know, enabling all students to um, experience academic success as well as well-being in schools. And the Center for Mental Health in Schools at UCLA describes the importance of this integrated student support and equity strategy that connects school, home, and community resources as essential to the well-being of children and youth and to enhancing um, equity, of, equity of opportunity for them to succeed in school and beyond. So um, we've also seen the importance of um, equity and inclusion in our, our uh, provincial policies, right? So in 2017, the Ontario Ministry of Education released the Ontario's uh, Education Equity Action Plan, which basically um, seeks to identify and eliminate discriminatory practices, systemic barriers, and biases from schools and classrooms to support the potential for all students to succeed. And this policy complemented the 2009 strategy um, which also had uh, all 72 school boards um, develop equity and inclusive education policies um, to support with the implementation of that strategy. So I definitely see the link because of the emphasis in the compassion-based framework on equity and system level shifts to our provinces and our education systems priority um, uh, in supporting equity for all of our students. Now, when it comes specifically to uh, refugee students, um, so according to the UNHCR, at the end of 2020, the number of forcibly, forcibly displaced persons worldwide who are fleeing conflict, human rights, and violence had reached 82.4 million, which is again, like it's a huge, massive number. And, and of those forcibly displaced people, so forcibly displaced meaning they had to leave their homes, they may be forcibly displaced within the parameters of their country, but refugees means they had to leave their country, they 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 are not no they are no longer residing within the parameters of their country. So, um, we have approximately twenty five point four million refugees, and nearly uh, half of them are children. So, over half uh, of these um, uh, new uh, uh, refugee populations have fled conflict from South Sudan, Afghanistan, and Syria. 
Syria has the, the highest number of uh, refugees wor worldwide, uh, recently reaching an estimated 6.7 million. In Canada specifically, between 2015 and 2017, we welcomed 84,000 refugees. And again, approximately 36,000 of them um, are uh, school age populations. So um, we have a huge number of refugee uh, students in our, in our Ontario schools. And we also now know uh, that there's been a wave of refugees from Afghanistan because of recent conflict. So with this substantial number of culturally, linguistically and religiously diverse refugee students, uh, there is this global interest in understanding how to support refugee students in positively adapting to their new environment and um, understanding that they they may have experienced numerous stressors and traumatic events because of their migration, resettlement, and uh, um, and uh, resettlement experiences. Now, when it comes to the importance of education for refugee students, researchers will tell us, and, and again, for all students, education is important. Um, to the life chances of individual refugees, to the present stability of the nation states in which they find exile, to the future reconstruction of the conflict affected societies from which they fled, and to the economic and politi political security of um, our, inter our interconnected world. Um, and really how education can be this type of healing process um, for refugee children. And again, any of our students who have experienced traumatic events, whether it's because of um, you know, a, a global pandemic or uh, what we call adverse childhood experiences, anything that can um, cause uh, trauma for our students. So um, there's also uh, sort of the needs of refugee students once they arrive to Canada have been characterized uh, broadly in three main areas, which are language learning, social integration, or a sense of belonging and well being. Uh, refugee student challenges, um, again, they may be more likely than immigrant students to experience academic challenges in part due to their untreated psychological trauma and um, perhaps again, uh, the need to understand the complex integration process. Uh, these uh, traumatic experiences can impact uh, their development process, uh, their scores on standardized tests. They may um, you know, end up uh, holding them back in terms of their progression in school or um, uh, lead them to being diagnosed with, spe with special needs. Um, it may also impact their relationships and behaviors. And uh, there's also uh, you know, the importance of recognizing that um, in addition to physical and emotional trauma, refugee students uh, may, have been, may have been residing in conflict zones or refugee camps where securing basic needs may have been very challenging. So when it comes to the challenges for school staff supporting their refugee students, um, Again, there's uh, you know research out there that says there's a there's a continuous need to develop this cross cultural um, understanding, a social justice focus, uh, transformative leadership skills, and policy guidance, and also um, with greater pressure on our principals related to work intensification. So you know things like uh, school pedagogical, social, demographic changes a worldwide pandemic, right? There's been increasing concerns about um, principals' well-being as well as uh, educators' well-being um, and uh, the possibility of experiencing vicarious trauma because of the, um, uh, the trauma that our students may be experiencing uh, in our classrooms. So in terms of um, support for newcomer refugee students, uh, you know, there's several sort of good practice um, recommendations out there. Um, and they include, again, things that are good for all of our students, the importance of a welcoming environment, free of racism, the need to meet psychosocial needs, particularly if there are uh, prior experiences of trauma and the, need, and the need to meet linguistic needs. There's also um, recommendations about targeted policies and system support, a commitment to social justice, a holistic approach to education and welfare, which considers the learning, social and emotional needs refugee students and their families, uh, community and interagency collaborations and leadership. And interestingly enough, all of these are very well, uh, very much related to the compassion-based framework that I will be speaking about shortly. Um, also in terms of a sense of uh, belonging, well-being and, and resilience, this sense of belonging piece, you know, it seems to be really recurring in terms of, uh, you know, um, supporting positive, uh, supporting the positive adaptation of refugee students. And again, all of our students, uh, there's a strong connection between engagement in the school context, feeling of belonging and positive adaptation across cultures. And that 
that belonging piece actually contributes a lot also to uh, resilience and civic participation. So again, I see a lot of links between what's recommended or what's good practice in terms of supporting uh, our students who have experienced trauma and the compassion-based framework, which I'm going to be um, speaking about. So the compassion-based framework um, came about again as a result of my interest in supporting students who have experienced uh, trauma. And it's uh, a part of a pro-social education approach to social emotional learning. So a lot of us who are educators may have heard about um, social emotional learning, SEL, right? Um, and there may be kind of different programs popping up in, in, in different areas. Uh, so this compassion-based framework is uh, linked to that. And again, it can contribute to greater student well-being by enhancing the social, emotional, cultural, and ethical aspects of schooling. So again, it's this holistic um, lens of looking at uh, student well-being. And um, again, it recognizes that students may be exposed to trauma and violence. Um, and uh, it's sort of this comprehensive theoretical model that uh, tries to approach education from uh, a compassion-based perspective. Now, um, some, of, uh, some of us may have heard of the trauma-informed trauma approach, which again, as, as an educator, uh, we may have been trained on in the past few years or um, you know, heard more about in our, in our practice. And again, I like to just sort of um, make a, an important distinction between compassion-based and trauma-informed that they may be used interchangeably. Um, and there are some commonalities between the two approaches, but there's an important nuance that when we review, when we, um, when we view refugee students or any student as traumatized, only as traumatized, we could impede a real analysis of their backgrounds and experiences and mask um, the significance of other factors that may be leading to this trauma, which could include poverty or isolation or racism or an uncertain migration status, right? So I think a trauma-informed approach is important in supporting students' positive adaptation and well-being and resilience. However, the compassion-based approach uh, really tries to approach that uh, well-being from a more holistic and asset-based perspective that focuses on strength and agency that students have, as opposed to just the, the deficit-based the deficit perspective. So in terms of the compassion-based framework and um, what's been sort of covered in the, in the literature, there are six elements um, to the compassion-based framework and um, they include school leadership, a safe, a safe and caring school culture, effective teaching and learning, parental and community involvement, compassion training programs and professional development for educators. And before delving into them, I wanted to give um, our audience a little bit of an opportunity to participate. So I actually have, um, a Jamboard link here that I'm going to uh, put into the chat. So we, uh, so what I'm going to ask everyone to do, if that's okay, is basically if we're going to spend about five minutes, um, if you click on that link in the chat, basically it will take you to a Jamboard where I would love to and. Uh, hear your feedback about what compassionate education looks like in school leadership. And again, this is just a brainstorm. There's, there's not a test. <laughs> just, just, I'd love to hear from you about what do you think a compassionate approach to education would look like in school leadership? And you can fill out any or, um, any or, uh, or all, depending on time. What does it look like in a safe and caring school culture? Um, what does it look like in effective teaching and learning? parental and community involvement and compassion uh, training programs and professional development. So what are the kind of skills that you think would be important for educators and administrators to start um, engaging in and learning more about to adopt this compassion-based perspective? So um, I'm not sure if you can see, I may have to stop uh, sharing for a second so you can see the Jamboard. Um, so, this is the Jamboard we've got here. And basically all you need to do is just click on it and then you could write in the sticky note what you, uh, what you add, or you could add your own sticky note too. I see some people are, um, have, used, uh, have already started adding. So I'm gonna give about five, five minutes to do that, just to brainstorm about what compassionate education looks like in each of those aspects. And then we'll come back in five minutes. Thank you.
We'll just give it about another minute to wrap up. It's great. I see a lot of responses and participation, which is great. So we'll give about another minute. Okay. So I will share my screen so you guys can see the Jamboard. You guys see the Jamboard there? Yes, perfect, great, okay. So it's great, we've got a lot of um, feedback on compassionate education and school leadership and you guys are right on, right? A lot of the things you mentioned, supporting of teachers, students, and family members beyond the academic curriculum, flexibility and understanding for difficult situations and students that need additional support, open to change, consider the ideas of others and thinking outside the box, facilitate communication between school community and leadership, listening and valuing different perspective, uh, perspectives, removing biases and stigma, seeing people that have suffered as people, seeing people the way they want to be seen. Wow, that's powerful. I think that's really, really powerful, seeing people the way they want to be seen. Making, understanding that people as the important as or more important than understanding the curriculum, um, valuing well-being over academic achievement, shared understanding of needs, listening, observing, seeking to understand. Yes, I see perhaps in Stephen Covey there, seek to understand uh, before being understood. Um, continuous critical reflection of conscious and unconscious biases, developing and practicing cultural empathy. Yes, yes, absolutely. Reevaluating traditional strategies like detention, moving towards more developmental approaches. And, and, and absolutely, right, and, and I, I'll get into this a little bit, but there are schools that have, you know, instituted mindfulness meditations instead of detentions, right? And again, they found noticeable differences in academic achievement and behavioral you know, um, uh, issues at school, right? And just overall more well-being. So absolutely, uh, prioritize student, um, both student mental health and learning needs. Uh, definitely, so I'm gonna go back to our slides for a minute so that we can talk a little bit more about leadership. So one of the um, interesting, uh, approaches to school leadership that I found, uh, you know, uh, complemented compassionate education. And again, many of the, uh, the aspects that you've mentioned here is uh, cross-cultural transformative school leadership. And this basically um, came about from uh, Dr. Shields' work, Dr. Carolyn Shields' work on transformative leadership. And it really talks about um, in, uh, critically analyzing the existing school culture uh, for leaders to critically an analyze the existing school culture in which they operate and consider how to cultivate a culture that prior prioritizes equity through policy and practice. So overall, it, you know, the, the emphasis in this leader leadership approach is on fostering cultural competence and educators and administrators in order to address the needs of students who may feel marginalized. Um, it discourages this deficit-based deficit -based perspective that I talked about earlier. Um, and really encourages more of, a, of an asset strength-based perspective. Um, also, uh, Noor, uh, you know, has uh, built upon Dr. Shields' work and talked about this ethic of care, uh, which originates from Dr. Nodding's work. Again, very much linked to this idea of compassionate education, where, um, you know, uh, it emphasizes the need for school leaders and for educators to be, uh, you know, emotionally attuned to their students and um, gain a greater awareness of their social psychological needs and academic challenges. Um, and also talks about this ethic of dialogue and understanding and social justice. So a lot of what you mentioned is really reflected in the research in terms of, um, uh, you know, a, a leadership approach that supports compassionate education. And Again, a lot of what you mentioned around uh, building relationships, knowing the students, the stories of our students, having compassion and empathy to treat the whole child. 
and uh, really understanding that early recognition intervention and follow through are essential to migrate, uh, mitigating or lowering the impact of trauma. And that again, one of the main criteria for these approaches is to address the attitudes and beliefs of um, educators towards the impact of trauma on students. So next we have um, school leadership and school culture. And I'm just gonna pop over into the Jamboard and see um, what we had there in terms of your feedback. So I think, uh, We've actually got one piece there. I'll just read it all quickly. Incorporating teacher continuing education on creating a compassionate culture so they're all as much as possible on the same page and, li and living the culture. And again, school leadership and school culture are, are very much linked. Um, so I'll, I'll just uh, speak uh, briefly about school culture. So, um, Again, uh, you know, the successful trauma-informed compassionate school approach um, requires the understanding that students who have experienced trauma need specialized supports, including mental health resources and supports in schools, right? So really incorporating those supports within the school, as opposed to um, only referring students to external mental health supports, because again, the research shows they're less likely to access those support services when they're outside of the school. Um, and again, leadership practices uh, that are uh, positive, non-intimidating, uh, developing strong relationships with staff and students, um, seeking relevant information and expertise that's shared with staff during professional development. Um, and again, having this welcoming, affirming and safe environment that uh, you know, really appreciates the unique learning styles, personal strengths and cultural backgrounds, uh, which, um, which are celebrated within the school environment. Um, I'm just going to look and see if we've got anything for, yeah, we've got some responses here for effective teaching and learning. So we've got students do a lot of things and not just absorb information passively, understanding learners and their experiences to inform teaching practice, absolutely. Being aware of the sociocultural context in which students are living and adopting teaching expectations to account for these realities valuing the thinking and learning differences of each individual, high engagement learning that creates positive emotions. Wow, that is awesome. Ongoing community and relationship building embedded throughout the course to better understand the complex needs of our students. Again, drawing on students' strengths. So all really important uh, pieces that you know are again reflected in the research and um, uh, sorry, I'll put this in present mode so that you guys can uh, see the full screen. There's actually a great resource that I'd like to uh, recommend. Um, it's a book that I recently started reading. Uh, the, sorry, I can't see it. The Compassionate Educator. I cite it in my key sources at the end, but basically um, in, in this book, there are several, you know, chapters that talk about how to infuse compassion into our teaching and learning. And, you know, they include things like exploring past experiences, the current needs and future goals and aspirations of our students. So, you know, um, talking about was there interrupted schooling in the past perhaps a student wasn't able to attend school for sometimes for sometimes two three four five years depending on um, if they were in a refugee camp or again any of our students right is there something going on at home that's impacting um, their their learning and again with trauma-informed learning they'll they'll tell us that it's not important that we necessarily know the details of all of that happened because students may not feel comfortable sharing and that's okay but it's it's um, allowing that uh, space and opportunity to know what our students would like to share with us. And again, if we feel like we need external support, we, you know, we call on the support of guidance counselors and, and, and school um, support staff with that. And again, that's part of effective teaching and learning is understanding our available supports, both internally and externally, communicating, communicating often and purposefully with students. So sometimes there may be a misperception that students are either understanding the curriculum, so they have no questions, or they're unengaged and sitting quietly in the class and not asking questions. So we really wanna encourage our students to ask questions, engage in discussions. Um, util utilizing past experience and knowledge um, again, this was mentioned, learning about and celebrating students' experiences and, uh, you know, using any kind of a modification of curriculum and inclusive practices. And, and I wanted to mention this at the beginning, these elements um, of compassionate education may not seem as something new. These are important to, you know, effective education in general. 
the piece that I'm going to get to that's really sort of the, the new piece is this idea of um, compassion training programs. And I think that's right after this one. So parental and community involvement first. Um, again, this idea of mil building multiple levels of partnerships, including community and university partnerships. Um, for example, for supporting newcomers, this is actually the, the core of my research, um, understanding the work of settlement workers in schools or Swiss, which is a partnership between community agencies and schools to support newcomer students and their families. And um, there's actually a unique example of a compassionate systems level collaboration between public schools, uh, university, and um, the, uh, you know, the, the state office of the superintendent of uh, public instruction um, uh, that happened that this was actually one of the first resources that drew me to this uh, compassion-based perspective. So we've got a video here that I hope will work for us. Students um, with 80. PhD save 10 hours just studying with this Chrome going extension. to confirm but no. that you can um, hear and see the video. So if you could just confirm if you can hear. And see. Across our state and throughout much of the nation, a greater number of students than ever before are struggling. For years, we have attempted to understand the root causes of lower success rates and an increasing number of dropouts. Kids who have been traumatized have always been in the school system. They get labeled as behavior problems usually, or they get relegated to special education classes, and teachers don't have any kind of training for them to recognize that a child's been traumatized. Modifications to curriculum and instructional strategy seem to have had little effect overall, but there are signs of hope. Teachers and administrators are increasingly turning to compassionate school and classroom strategies to improve the social and emotional well-being of students, strengthening families and communities. We're seeing there are decreases in acting out behaviors in school. We're seeing kids increase their attendance in school. We're seeing just a general more positive climate and feel. And I think we're seeing educators finding a new sense of hope. That hope is founded in a new written work entitled The Heart of Learning and Teaching, Compassion, Resiliency, and Academic Success. Every day, millions of children arrive at public schools throughout the country. There are more than a million in Washington state alone. They come from different backgrounds, cultures, and family situations, and they each have their own unique personal struggles. Schools must overcome these challenges to meet educational standards. My first two years here at Manitou Park uh, was filled with a lot of violence and tragedy. We were also seeing a lot of children in poverty and coming to us with a lot of traumatic experiences. I've been at Manitou about seven or eight years and I have really seen things change even just at this school with not only different curriculum but with the different behaviors that we have had with the students that I've worked with. Schools are beginning to discover that academic success is dependent on many factors, inside and outside of the classroom. Uh, we were seeing kids that were dropping out of school, kids that were not getting engaged in school or staying engaged in school, and uh, it wasn't all about academics. It was about how they were functioning in their daily lives that determined whether or not they were going to academically achieve. Trauma and adversity can affect any child, regardless of age, economic class, or the community in which they live. Where trauma comes from isn't always something horrific. It can be everyday things. And what's traumatic to one person is not the same for someone else. We all have different levels for how we take things in. It's hard to play chess in a hurricane. And to expect kids to calculate math when they're calculating where they're going to sleep tonight to ask kids to have perfect penmanship when their life is a mess, to ask kids 
to read a story when they can't even find words to describe the story of what's going on in their own lives. It's not reasonable. Many so I will stop it there and we will pop back into our slides. So um, this brings me to uh, talking more about compassion training programs. And this is really sort of the key to, if you will, I think it's, I, I don't think it's isolated. I don't think it's the only thing. We need this sort of overall framework that we've talked about, school leadership, school culture, effective teaching and learning, parental and community involvement. But this is, I think, the missing piece in terms of really giving that compassionate education approach uh, a push. Um, and it's this idea of systematic methods of cultivating compassion. So compassion, yes, is a natural capacity that are, you know, all human beings can be born with, but it's actually a skill that can be broadened, that can be strengthened. And so, um, you know, there, there was a, a meta-analysis that was done of 82 school-based social emotional learning programs, which, you know, there is research to show these programs are effective and long lasting, but what they noticed was noticeably absent from these social emotional learning programs was the, the important construct of compassion. Compassion for oneself, compassion for others, um, and receiving compassion from others. So there, there's various train, uh, compassion training programs that have you know popped up and I've been involved in a couple and, and participated and completed a couple and I've really found that they've enhanced my um, you know, skill set and uh, perspective as an educator, as a parent, as a researcher, as a human, really. Um, and again, while there's a variety of programs, they really seek to broaden specific capacities that include things like uh, attention and empathy and courage. And, um, you know, th there's different programs. Again, one of the ones that I've completed, the Compassion Integrity Training, is a combination of neuroscience and psychology and trauma-informed care, uh, peace and conflict studies, and um, it basically focuses on uh, these sort of 10, 10 areas which, uh, again, um, encourage us to support, uh, to support well-being, and they include calming body and mind, ethical mindfulness, emotional awareness, self-compassion, impartiality and common humanity, forgiveness and gratitude, empathic concern, compassion, appreciating interdependence and engaging with discernment. And I think it's well worth mentioning here that we can't talk about compassion without self-compassion. We can't talk about compassion without talking about compassion fatigue, right? I think we all know as educators, especially, that, they, that there is this sense of you know, collective fatigue uh, because of the pandemic and again dealing with all of the uncertainty and and um, how that's reflecting on our students as they come back into our classrooms but um, one of the important most important things that I've learned in um, bringing compassion into our studies is this idea of self-compassion right and Dr. Kristen Neff is the self-compassion guru if you will she's out of Berkeley University and she's written a book on this entire topic and really I think that the key to um, bringing more compassion into our schools is self-compassion. And again, the research shows that people who practice self-compassion are, are happier, more optimistic, um, it leads to more gratitude and better relationships, less stress because it's uh, a powerful antidote to self-criticism and perfectionist thinking. Um, and also it leads to more resilience. So um, the ability to bounce back more easily from setbacks and more likely to learn from mistakes. So again, I, I really think, um, one of the key things is, is these systematic compassion training programs. And there are schools, especially in the US, um, also UNESCO, for example, has picked up some of these compassion training programs and started implementing them in, in schools in India um, and across the world. So um, personally, I, I would be a proponent of starting to see more of these programs in our schools, in our school districts, in our universities. There's a lot of studies that also running these programs with um, students who are in medical programs, teaching programs, nursing programs at universities. Uh, the research shows that certainly participating in these types of programs can lead to less stress and burnout. So there's a compassion training uh, programs piece. And then finally, there's professional development, which again is linked to compassion training. But again, this um, talks about how um, professional development for students and educators, right? So having, again, this holistic approach that promotes the success of school-wide programs, right? Um, and also 
internal and external and involving the community. And again, they found that uh, when we train our teachers on these um, and educators on these important aspects of uh, mindfulness and compassion and empathy, um, it can lead to improved uh, management of instructional time. It can lead to enhanced relationships between student and students and teachers, as well as reduced uh, educator stress and burnout. And again, um, having that sort of uh, looking into the effect of uh, programs that are, that are available for both students and staff um, can, can have uh, you know, a promising, uh, promising outlook for more systemic change across the school and more ongoing sustainable change. So um, in conclusion, I'd like to end with a quote for, um, sorry, let's get back there. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, a quote for uh, Dr. Um, Christopher Cook. He's a prof professor of political science and social science at Western Connecticut um, and the author of the book, The Compassionate Achie Achiever, How Helping Others Fuels Success. He says that compassion is the most consistent but underappreciated characteristic of successful people across occupations. And the profound benefits of practicing compassion include more constructive relationships, improved intelligence and increased resiliency. So, um, Again, the, the compassion-based framework is uh, fairly um, emerging in terms of uh, you know, the, its presence in the research and there needs to be more development on it. But I think we, we need it now more than <laughs> ever perhaps, again, because of the um, increased level of, uh, levels of stress and trauma that we are experiencing, um, both because of, again, conflict, disease, um, and natural disasters, again, as mentioned at the beginning. So I hope that uh, today has provided some perspective on compassionate education. And um, I've just got a slide here for key sources at the end. So a lot of my presentation today is actually from a forthcoming chapter I have in a book on leading uh, for equity in Canada, uh, edited by Dr. Shields um, and Dr. Pulex. Uh, so that'll be coming out hopefully in 2022. Um, there's also the book I mentioned, The Compassionate Educator. Um, this resource, which I can pop into the chat if you'd like, The Heart of Teaching and Learning, Compassion, Resilience, and Academic Success. That's where I showed uh, part of the video from. And also the Oxford Handbook of Compassion Science uh, has been put out by the Oxford University Press. So I will pop that link in the chat and then I will open up for questions. Thank you so much for listening. So I think if you have any questions, um, I will check the Q&A. You're welcome to pop them in the Q&A or message me directly. So one of our questions is, have you seen examples of compassionate education being practiced in Canada? I have yet to see it. Um, I, again, I would, I would love to. If you know of any, please let me know. <laughs> um, I think uh, perhaps there are things happening in pockets of school districts that I may not be aware of. And again, for instance, a lot of schools have character education programs that perhaps talk about compassion in, in those programs. But in terms of a, a systemic approach that really you know, incorporates all of those elements that we talked about, um, I'm currently not aware, but if you, if anybody is, please feel, feel free to let me know. I will actually pop my email also in here so that if anyone's interested in reaching out. So we've got Paul Najjar who said Roots of Empathy program. Okay, so that's interesting. I will note that down because that's something I would definitely like to look more into. Thank you, Roots of Empathy. Um, how can this model be relevant in a university setting? So again, good question. I think, you know, all of those aspects that we mentioned, the school leadership, the school culture, the effective teaching and learning, um, the community involvement, the compassion training programs. Uh, again, I think it could start with having these sort of compassion training programs perhaps being introduced to these, some of these programs that I mentioned where um, students may perhaps be experiencing higher levels of stress, nursing programs, medical science programs, teaching programs, um, and um, starting there, even if it's with small pilot groups. And then again, if we're talking about uh, 
systemic leadership, just inviting um, inviting our leaders to perhaps uh, uh, start engaging in um, book club discussions or uh, in attending working group meetings, right? Um, we know that there's been a big push towards equity, diversity, and inclusion in, in, in the past couple of years, and there's been a lot of working groups and um, staff hired on to bring that on. And, and I think, to be honest, compassion is also one of the um, important piece, pieces in equity, diversity, and inclusion work. So personally, I am hoping to bring that compassion lens into my EDI work at Western. And I think um, certainly it's something that, uh, just like if you have champions for any any particular cause, whether it's anti-racism or whether it's um, you know um, decolonization, right? This is something that uh, can be um, you know uh, prioritized with working groups, um, with pilot programs that start running in terms of compassion training programs. Uh, perhaps in certain faculties again that that uh, that see more of a need for it with their students. Um, what are the main differences between trauma informed education and compassion education? Uh, uh, compassion education. So I think I mentioned that you know they're used interchangeably and there are many similarities. But the one nuance that I see again is that. Uh, perhaps, and again, this just reflects some of the research. There may be, as you know, with research, there may be a variety of research about a particular topic, but um, the, uh, the trauma-informed, um, uh, the compassionate-based framework doesn't just look at the trauma that students may have experienced, right? So it's not a deficit-based deficit perspective. It's really more of an asset, strength-based, holistic well-being perspective that looks at supporting the well-being of students from social, emotional, you know, um, psychological, physical, environmental. So that's the main difference. But there are certainly a lot of similarities between the two. Um, how would you imagine a focus on compassionate education in civil society beyond K-12 schools and post-secondary education? So actually, the compassion training programs um, that I participated in were started off mainly community-driven. So they did not actually start off um, in schools. Um, uh, they started off just, you know, in, in perhaps faith groups, uh, church groups, mosque groups, community agency groups, uh, synagogues, right, uh, temples, right. So a lot of it started uh, from this sort of community-based uh, grassroots perspective, um, you know, just in neighborhood groups, even again, uh, as part of like a book club model, right? Or participating in these programs. So these compassion training programs are, a lot of them are open to, to everyone. And I think again, it's kind of like creating ripples, right? Um, I think when community picked up on it and saw how powerful it can be in building communities, right? If we could start to build compassionate communities that it can have also great impact in our schools and in our uh, universities and our post-secondary uh, institutions. And um, someone asked, is this part of my research that I'm doing or part of my current or ongoing work? It's both. So it is part of my research and it is certainly something that I hope um, will continue to be a part of my work. Uh, it'd be interesting to consider how compassion-based education aligns with Rafi's child honoring education. I will look into that. Thank you very much. Okay. I think I answered everything in the um, Q&A box. I'm gonna pop in quickly and see if I got any uh, questions directly to me. Okay. Uh, I don't see any here. Um, I think we should give that about two more minutes um, just to wait and see if there's anyone else, you know, waiting to, to type out their, their questions. Sure, of course. What drew you to this work? So um, I mentioned at the beginning, Debbie, um, I participated in a compassion cultivation training uh, out of the Compassion Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education 
uh, several years ago at Stanford. And, and really, to be honest, I think what drew me to it is just my own spiritual journey and practice, right? As we know, compassion is universal to many faiths and, and um, just a universal human value. And I just wanted to see how it could be more reflected in our schools um, and in our communities, right? Because I think, again, when we, when we look a lot, a lot at a lot of our challenges, just as, as you know, um, again, even in terms of the, the EDI work that I'm doing right now, um, I'd really like to bring it back to kind of basics, right? Like, let's just, let's just go back to basics, right? It's just, it's about connecting, right? It's about understanding the struggle. It's about understanding that we all struggle as a collective humanity and it's understanding how we can support each other. Um, so I think, I think what drew me to it is really um, wanting to see um, just more positive, nourishing, supportive, caring communities and schools. Thank you for that question. I think there's a couple more. Okay, Ruth, thank you for your question. What is one action educators could take tomorrow to move towards supporting the compassion-based framework? Um, again, it depends what, uh, what level you're in, right? Primary, secondary, post-secondary. I think it just, um, I would say, to be honest, it begins with self-compassion. I would say it really begins with self-compassion. Because I think, again, we're at a time where educators are really um, working very hard, right? And, and perhaps, you know, again, trying to manage the, the, the stress and fatigue of, um, you know, uh, working in the pandemic. So I'd say to start with self-compassion, right? Just give yourself that, that kindness um, that you would give to someone that you care about. Is there anything else in the chat? Someone asked if I can uh, share this information with the Arabic speaking community. Yes, I can share it with any 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 speaking community that's interested in in hearing me. Thank you. Please feel free to reach out. I've popped my email in the um in the chat. So please feel free to reach out if this is something that is of interest to your um, school or district or community. Um, uh, feel free to reach out. And again, um, if I can't uh, do it, I will be happy to uh, uh, you know, refer. Again, we have um, my, a colleague here from the Compassion Integrity Training Program that I participated in. So I'd be happy to refer to uh, resources. Yeah, okay, um, I think we can now end the Q&A uh, section for tonight. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, thank you, Ragan, for leading this fantastic conversation on compassionate education. Um, our next talk is on March 30th, so please check out the Waterloo Public Library event calendar to register. Uh, thank you again, and have a good night. Thank you. I'd like to add my thanks, and thank you to all the participants. Thank you, Manreet, and thank you, Mariah, and uh, have a good evening and see you next month. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. That was wonderful. Thank you.